Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Thanks for coming, Sam. Good to see you. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Michael, for inviting me. Oh, no, that's brilliant. Uh, you're a fellow podcaster. I can see you go on a lot of podcasts, which is great. I wish I was actually getting on a few more as well. But um, I'm really looking forward to your story. I Obviously, I've looked on social and read a bit about you, but I'm really interested to know how it all got started, you know, the beginning. So I'll ask the first question I ask all my guests, which is, Tell us a little bit about yourself, meaning where were you born? Have you moved around? Where were you educated? What did you do there? Your first job, your career? And then we'll get into present day and we'll deep dive into all the wonderful things you're doing today. Yeah. Um, I'm very interested. I know that you're an expert in emotional intelligence, a subject that interests me a lot. So we can have a good chat about that. And um, yes, yeah, Sam, over to you. Thank you, Michael, for inviting me to be on your podcast. Well, uh, my journey began in uh, Karachi, Pakistan, which is uh, a country which has been uh, at an Independence Day tomorrow, 14th of August. Wow. I believe it is almost 50 plus year. Uh, but I I'm not 50. Well, I'm 50 years old, but... <laughs> but... <laughs> but uh, um, I would say I left, uh, I was born in Pakistan, uh, specifically the city of Karachi. Uh, yes. And I did my bachelor degree uh, in Pakistan. I completed, uh, I started a business in Pakistan in the IT sector, uh, right. which was uh, doing uh, all sorts of IT related tasks, uh, selling, and, uh, selling and sorting out users' issues and everything and making sure that everybody is on the same page in regards yes. to support and everything. And uh, then I got married in 1996, uh, which has started a new journey for me. And I yeah. left Pakistan and came to UK in 1996. Oh. So that was a, like, uh, uh, quite a big uh, uh, change of my uh, journey. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, and uh, I came here uh, and joined my first wife because she was British and ah. uh, from Pakistan. So well, she's from, uh, her background is uh, from Pakistan. Her father was a Pakistani. So we met in Pakistan and uh, we introduced to each other and then we found that this is the right thing to do. So we got right. married and we settled, I settled in, well, uh, in, in, in the UK. So my first visit to the UK was uh, well, um, south of London which was uh, Collier's Wood, uh, yes. Judith Back, uh, Mitcham, Statham Well. These were the areas I came in. And yes. as we all started to embrace the culture, embrace the accent, embrace the other things, so I picked up Cockney and started uh -huh. to embrace my <laughs> dialect. And uh, so still, uh, it was quite an a interesting journey, I would say. Uh, well. I can say it now, it was a very interesting journey, but uh, yes. back then it was quite uh, uh, challenging, the word I'm using, uh, and I will say why I have now changed that word to adventures in my further um, story. Yes. So 1996 was the era I came to UK and joined my first wife, and arriving in the UK was the... Um, bank holiday, May bank holiday, and it was uh, completely grayed out the country. And I said to my, at that moment, wife said, oh, wow, what a beautiful day. What a romantic day. And she looked at me and said, you must be joking. I said, no, no, it's beautiful. <laughs> a man who lived in a country with uh, uh, sunshine every day for yeah. almost 25 years, Yes. Coming to a country which does not have a sun, it's, it's, it's definitely a romantic day for me because <laughs> <laughs> under the sun. So it was like, okay, you wait and see what happens afterwards. And then yes. I did actually embrace it that the sun was not to be seen in the UK and every no. day 
same day and it was raining it was uh, uh pouring down and um, but you know we all uh, have to embrace it that's the yeah. best way forward if you don't embrace it you will find it more challenging to mm. ascertain yourself with your life going forward so as my background was in uh, information and technology it uh, yeah. uh, looking for a job was challenging in the beginning as uh, uh, whatever uh, applications or whatever softwares or whatever uh, experience i had in it i superseded a lot of people over here and i would really know what i was looking for so i have to start from scratch here Gosh. okay and uh, and and i was luckily i was very good with uh, my typing skill so i was 60 word per minute touch touch typist yes so i found a job which allows me to just do drafting of letters in uh, department of social services the oh, report right. and everything at that time so i thought let's begin the journey and mm. so i started my journey here with that job and i'm privileged to be part of that job and increasing because as you have that experience of where you coming from and what experience you have you started to interacting with people about your skill sets and people said said if you know that you should be in that job or that job your career should yes. be over there yes. so i found uh, uh, maneuvering myself from different jobs to different jobs and ultimately i went straight into my dedicated area of it after right. after 3 years while working what, what 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 kind of area was that in it so i was in the sort of a uh, uh, customer support area where i was right. customers with any problems with their desktop or laptops or any other issues they are experiencing so oh, i was okay. on the phone and says sam i got a problem can you help can you help me and i'll say i'll help you on the phone or i can connect to your computer or i can come and see you so you can offer yes. me your biscuit so we can have a quick chat as well while i'm sorting out your problem yes 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 So the journey begins from there and I started increasing my education and a couple of other things in regards to that to get more uh, into different level of uh, my career ladder. Yes. And uh, and I went to from uh, from a, a desktop support to a, a leader to a manager position during that period of time and I mm-hmm. used myself into different categories in terms of how I look at life in different generally differently. And yes. um, one notion is that uh, the community which i came from uh, we have this uh, uh, motto that is called work no word which means that we have to serve do service to others without saying a single word you just do the job you just do the task and whatever task has been assigned to you just do it with a yes. smile on your face you do not question you just do yes. it So yes. I'm part of that community where we are being doing voluntary services uh and we've been helping in different areas of different lives within our community I was been given an opportunity to work in a a, a project called a lifelong learning project where I used to do a coaching to a lot of people in that and that's where the coaching started in my my blood that this is very good I'm very good at with talking to people i'm very good at with listening to people a yeah. listening part is also one another thing as i will bring it that in the conversation that yeah we says we are a very good listener are we mm. um, because we learn a lot of things during our own journey and uh, listening was one of those things i felt that i'm a good listener it turns out that i wasn't a good listener i was yeah. a good fixer i can fix things yeah uh, we always have a head of fixing a lot of things as a man we become fixers instead of listeners and that where i found a lot of uh, uh challenges in my my personal life and that what affected me in different ways that i could not uh, communicate with my ex wife or she could not yes. communicate with me correctly because right. i tried to fix everything yes. and i learned a very good lesson in that and then i become uh what i call it a journey on my journey of uh 
to become a counselor, to become a youth coach. During that phase of going through understanding where where the career is like for me, what is my yeah. career, what is my uh, purpose in life. Mm. These are all things started to unfold to me. Uh, emotional intelligence on the side, as we talk about further down the line, emotional intelligence is one of those things which came to me in 2007. And I was uh, been handed over that book called Emotional Intelligence by Daniel Goldman, by one of yeah. my friends. And she says, Sam, I think this book is going to be good for you. And I said, really? I looked at the book, turned on two chapters, and I says, no, no, I left it <laughs> on the book, bookshelf. And uh, that come back in 2016, that book again in my hand. Right. That's the journey begins of emotional intelligence. Now, that period... Okay, so hold, of, hold, I'm, I'm going to hold you there. Just pause for a second because I feel we might be going a little bit fast. I just want to backtrack a little bit Go. on you mentioned that you were doing youth coaching and you became a counsellor. So did you get like training and qualified in those areas or was it just a progression naturally in the job that had happened? It happened to, yeah. So there were two things happen and uh, is a natural progression while I was doing a lot of work within the youth sector but mm. I did went for my qualification in, in counseling and right. also in uh, uh, learning in adult education as well right. so those qualification I was continuing gathering those qualifications in understanding that yes I have experience but qualification is a good thing and during that phase, while doing youth coaching and everything, I started a charity called Empowering Youth with one of my friends in the in the London area, right. where we are talking to all the youths in the school. Even though we were not being given any uh, donations or anything like that, but we were just putting in from our own pocket, just yeah, to voluntary. the school in that capacity. Yeah, but this all came about by you doing the voluntary work in your community, correct? Correct. And were you still at the same time continuing with your job in IT as well? Yes. 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 That's the full time so you job. Had a, so you were kind of doing this at the weekends or in the evening or um So within my IT job, uh, because I was working for a quite a good firm, uh, they had a dedicated a voluntary capacity within the right. company to offer to communities. So I put my name down to be part of that. So the youth coaching or connecting with the school came from that particular area where I was being told that, Sam, we need you to do this sort of activity with uh, young children or uh, our youth who are going for interview skills or they are lead to look at their CV or anything like that. So I was engaged in those sort of things. So I was part of uh, Slough Grammar School. I was part of a couple of other Twickenham Grammar School and a couple of part of schools which were in part of West London area because yes. I was living in West London at that time. Uh, so that continued from that journey. But within the community, because we every week days or week uh, weekend we have some sort of communication with different departments within the community yeah. we used to get a chance to work in the lifelong learning sector where we've been dedicated given some people to work with there will be youth as well as there were quite uh, old people as well in there so they're looking yeah. to find what is lying there for them to engage their mind in understanding yeah. in learning new things in yeah. learning business. So that's what includes that while doing a full time job, even though having children as well, trying to serve the community, serve the family, it was all going full on at that time. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. I bet. Okay. Great. So now we're in 2016 where you got the book Emotional Intelligence again in your hand. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> and what what did you do with it this time? Put it back on the shelf? <laughs> no, 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 no. The story is started from here. So um, I fin I got divorced in uh, twenty thirteen uh, because uh, we did not the work it did not work out my marriage with my my last wife. Uh, we have three beautiful children. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a father of three beautiful children. My older older daughter is twenty one. And mm -hmm. I have got a set of twins. They are 17 years old. So they are all uh, uh, in their uh, teen, teens, yes. I would say, maturity. Um, yes. But when I got divorced in 2013, it was very heartbroken because uh, uh, as a father, I was always there for my children. Yes. Uh, even though working tirelessly hard, I never turned a uh, stone in terms of I was not present for their birthday parties or their friend birthday parties or dropping them to school or collecting them from school or making sure that they were I was there in the weekend with them so I was yeah. there and it suddenly happened that my ex decided to ask for divorce and I said yeah sure go for it um, I, I did not uh, fuss about it because there were a lot of things happened during that period which were not in anybody's favor at that time yeah. and I felt you know that's the right time let us move on with life and uh, she decided to move from London to Birmingham, take my children there. And, mm -hmm. and I was actually, every weekend I was traveling back and forth to collect them and drop them and collect them and drop them sort of things. Yeah. And, and that's when we decided to sell the, the home, that's when my journey started to unfold that what is going to be the next case, uh, course of action I need to take. So yes. 2015, we sold our property, which was uh, on our both's name, and we decided to split the cash. Yeah. And I decided to leave the country for six months because it okay. was too much. Things were going on in 2015. I left the job. I decided to go to my 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 friend, my family back in Pakistan, which I never yes. visited for eight years. Uh, during that period, my mom passed away. My dad passed away. Uh, my my. Wow. My few other uh, uh, aunt and uncle passed away. I never visited them. Uh, so that was another area which uh, uh, I wanted to, you know, go there and trying to spend time with my, fa my family, my brothers. It was a big vacuum in there. Yes. So I went there and I met, also met my, my very best friend as well, who is, who is a trainer over there in Pakistan. And because I was only the one there, he says, Sam, you know what? Instead of sitting at home and uh, waiting for me in the evening, why don't you come along with me to all my trainings? Right. And I said, oh, that's a good idea. Why not? Let me jump on. I will learn yes. something new things. And that's where begins the emotional intelligence journey. And he right. was an expert in emotional intelligence and he was teaching emotional intelligence. And I said, do you know what? I read the book. Actually, I read two chapters of this book. I said, you read two <laughs> chapters? I have the whole course designed on that book. So why don't you just jump on the course with me? Yes. So that journey begins from there and started to learn about emotional intelligence. But when I came back in 2016, I wanted to dive further into emotional intelligence. Yes. So I went into British Society of Psychology and completed the uh, two level on uh, understanding the psychometric assessment of emotional intelligence right and that's what i completed and i'm, I'm a certified psychometric assessor for emotional intelligence wow uh, as well as disc which yes. majority of people use disc as well so i'm i'm fully certified for both of them and i help individuals with emotional intelligence as well as this, if they're looking to identify what are their area of strength and development. There is no such thing as weaknesses because we are learning all the time. Yes. So that's how my journey begins with emotional intelligence. Wow. And so where, when you came back to the UK, what year was that again? 2016, January. 26, yeah, 2016. So about five years ago. And uh, just over five, where did you move to this time? So I finished off with my uh, main home. I mm. moved to North London. Right. And that's where you are now? 
No, I no. moved from North London <laughs> to, uh, to Birmingham now. Right, okay. So yeah. you're closer to your kids now? Yeah, and close to my kids, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. That's really good news. So okay. 2016, I moved to North London. Mm. 2017, I moved to Birmingham. Okay, brilliant. So emotional intelligence. So you arrive back in the UK, says, I'm certified. And how, how did you then get started? What happened next? Well, that's another journey in terms of how you interact with people, how you connect with people in terms of emotional intelligence. A lot of people, when you talk about emotional intelligence, people are still unaware of this subject mm. because we talk about IQ, which is intelligent caution. Mm. Well, are you intelligent enough to understand the requirement of the project or the requirement of the task which I have given you to complete? Yes. Oh, yes, I am. Are you emotionally intelligent? What is that? Yeah. Or well, somebody says something to you, are you going to take it as it is, comes to you or are you going to defend yourself? Yes. Are you a good listener? Are you going to listen to the person, what they are saying to you or they are going to, you are going to say, you know what, you just do your job, what you are asked to be told to do instead of listening to the person and says, how can I help you as I can be in empathy for you to me to listen to you mm. as what is going on in your life without yeah. any judgment, putting any information or anything like that. Now, we went through COVID. We are going through with COVID. A lot of people yeah. have lost their jobs. We've yeah. been on the world. Up. How many people are being interact with a lot of people and saying, oh, by the way, you know, you are being followed. How are you doing? Yeah. How many people has asked that question? Not mm. many people have asked that question. No. So emotional intelligence is all about self-awareness. Mm. Your self-awareness. Not everybody yeah. else's self-awareness. Your self-awareness. Once you master that about your self-awareness and what makes you content, what mm. triggers you in a different ways. Yeah. When you listen to somebody or when you are on the road and somebody cuts you off, how do you feel about it? Are you going to swear at that person? Are you going to make a big uh, honk on them? Mm. Yeah. Or you just smile and let it be. Yeah. That comes with the self-awareness pillar of emotional intelligence. Mm. And these are the element of emotional intelligence, the so self-awareness, self-regulation. Then you come as motivation, empathy, and social skills. Mm. These are all connected to each other. They can't be disconnected from each other in any ways. If you are mm. self-aware, you're going to have a self-regulation means self-management of uh, decisions you're going to make. Yes. So you are a leader or you are a father, for example. Yeah. You, come in the, you wake up in the morning and you're getting ready for your workplace and suddenly your daughter drops a juice on your trousers. <laughs> How are you going to react? Yeah. Are you going to be shouting? Or are you going to be saying, be careful next time, darling. Mm. That he has to go to work. Or, or you're going to be started saying, you know, there's one thing I'm telling you, you don't listen or you don't do it sort of things. Mm. It means you are not uh, have self-awareness in yourself. Mm. Because you are picking things from somebody else. Somebody else's energy is triggering you something. Or your own energies, which is you are suppressing in yourself. Is yeah. coming back. Yeah. And that's where the self-regulation piece comes in. So self-awareness, self-regulation, and then motivation. Once these two, two first two pillars are in line with it, you become so self-motivated. You are started to do things with smile, with encouragement. You always talk about positivity. You look at outside, you say somebody says to you, for example, uh, is uh, uh, is going to be nineteen percent chances of sunshine. Mm. Looking at saying that thing is come out as so there is seventy one chance seventy one percent chances of rain. No, no, look at nineteen percent rain. There's chances of nineteen percent sunshine, mm. but we do not look at that. We always look at what is negativity. 
terms of yeah. how you articulate. And the way you start articulating your making sentences and everything, the way you say, people will listen. People will say, yeah. oh yeah, I can understand what that person is talking about. The way you say to things like, I say to you, if I'll give you a command, Michael, can you do this for me, please? Or I will not say, please. I'll say, can you do this, please, or not? Mm -hmm. And you'll say, I'll think about it. Mm -hmm. But if I'll say, would you be okay if you can kindly do this task for me? Mm -hmm. This is the two different sentences. Yeah. And it comes with self-awareness and self-contentment and everything comes to you. And then you'll say, okay. A yeah, person is talking and person is connecting and you started to engage with people uh, conversation and people start to listen to you because they yeah. feel that there is some sort of a connection. Yeah, and I mean, something, actually, it's, it's something you've hit a nerve really because self-awareness where you say it or where it starts, um, one thing... That is true, um, that we're conditioned when we're younger by our parents, by our teachers, by, the, by our peers, by our siblings, by you know, the media, by the news, by social media now. You know, so we, we grow up being conditioned by all of these different factors. And when you get later in life, you wonder why you're a miserable person or you're not choosing the right kind of language, as you're suggesting, in communicating with people. And, you know, some bad things happen. Relationships break down. You lose your job or something else happens, you know. And slowly, slowly, the kind of onion is peeled and you're now starting to look at yourself and kind of go, there's only one person in this room and it's me. So what's wrong with me, you know, and when you, when you realize that there is some conditioning that's taken place, you can, through that self-awareness thing, I suppose, start noticing when you fly off the handle or you react to that driver. I'm, I'm a cyclist, Sam, so I, I'm a Dutchman and I cycle. I love cycling. But there are no cycle paths in this country, not many, in some city centres, but not in the countryside. And the roads are very narrow as well. So there's not much room for a cyclist and a car to, to be side by side. The car has to pass the bicycle. And car drivers, because although Britain is a... Olympic champion in cycling. They didn't do as well this year, but normally for the past decade, they've won every medal going. But not that many people really has gone up a little in co during COVID cycle, right? So car drivers have no comprehension of what it's like when a car goes full speed past you. It's a real shock. There is the draft of the wind and, you know, there's the noise. They get very close. You, they have no concept of what it's like because they don't cycle themselves. They haven't experienced it. And it's been something that I've really struggled with. I no longer, <laughs> this is how far I've come in the 40 years that I've lived in this country, over 40 years. I no longer give him the middle finger. I've stopped that now, right? I'm almost, almost stopped shaking my head, going, you know, stop shaking my head when they do it because I'm hoping maybe they see in their reverse mirror that I'm going like this, you know. At one point, instead of showing my middle finger, I was showing the thumb down. Um, you know, saying how bad it was. And and in fact, sometimes it's got me into trouble too. Um, so I haven't been pushed off my bike yet by anybody. But, but now, and it's only in the past kind of six months or so, 
because I've been studying something similar, but not exactly emotional intelligence, but it's related. And, you know, it's back to that awareness and kind of going, God, look at me reacting to that. And slowly, slowly, I'm just kind of chipping away at it to reduce it. But it's not easy, Sam. It's not it's easy. Not, it's not. I'll give you a give you a simple scenario. Um, you will be completely uh, blown away with the scenario. So uh, you are expert in your skill sets. I'm expert in my skill sets. Uh, I'm still learning. We are all learning. We can't say ex ourselves uh, expert until we know that we are an expert, a certain degree. So. DIY, I do DIY in the house, but uh, guttering or uh, uh, sort of things is not my forte. I'm yeah. not interested in those sort of things. So we will invite in specialists to do the jobs, correct? Mm. So I call in and a specialist. I say, listen, I got a problem with the blockage and I need this to be sorted. Yeah. The guy said to me, yeah, yeah, Mr. Dosa, that's fine. We will send somebody who's going to unblock your things and we will get it all sorted. We'll yeah. spend about three hours and we will do this, we will do that. I'll say, okay, that's fine. So I sent uh, the guy, sent an engineer, engineer arrived, he looked at the problem and says, well, well, it's not going to be fixed now. And I said, okay, but you just looked at the, you assessed the sh issue. So you say it's not going to be fixed now. Instead of uh, telling me, uh, he says, well, it's going to cost you this much money. I'll say, okay. That's fine, but but for this time, you're supposed to spend three hours to sort out this issue. He says, well, I can't do it. I said, okay, I need to speak to your boss because I'm not going to be paying you because you just spent 15 minutes and as you're asking me to pay you the entire amount. So I called in to the boss and boss, if you are a, a genuine business owner, you will listen to your customer, mm. correct? Mm. Instead, what he did, he just started swearing at me. Right. Left and center, he would start swearing at me. And I was just mm. listening, and my wife was standing next to me and said, Sam, why are you not retaliating? I said, well, why should I retaliate? Because this person does not have emotional intelligence. Yes. He's not looking at his business as a long, long, longer term. He's looking at the shorter term in terms of we'll just get the money and goodbye. Yes. So he swear at me for almost five to seven minutes. And end of the day, I said to him, listen, you want your money? I'll put your money in your account. Don't worry. I don't want your services. Thank you very much. Goodbye. And I contemplated that scenario for whole night. And I said, I should make a complaint about this. So I call in the morning and say, well, I call somebody and to do this, this, but I need to make a complaint. So I said, okay, uh, we will put you through to the director. Of the company, and guess yes. what? Who was that? Is the same person. Oh yeah. He says, uh, "I'm extremely sorry. I would like to call you yesterday to say sorry to you the way I behaved on the phone." Mm. And I said, "Listen, uh, are you a family member? Are you a family man?" He says, "Yes, I got children." I said, "Okay." So that's uh, how you talk to your customer. I'm not an expert in guttering. I'm not expert in those sort of things. You mm. should have said to me that Mr. Dosa, my engineer has assessed the shoe, and I think we can fix it for you, but it's going to cost you this much money. Mm. Would you like us to start the work? Instead, you started swearing at me, shouting at me, and expecting me to know the solution. If you ask me, come to my office and sort out my office issues, which is a conflict management or some sort of issues going on, I'll mm. say, yeah, I'll come and do it for you because I have some expert in this those sort of area i can help you and if you go ask me and call me and say come and fix my air condition i said no it's not my area mate i'm not an air condition engineer mm. so i was completely shocked at how you deal with your customer that way and yeah and i said the journey i was on I'm, I'm still on the journey to listen to your customer and listen that what they want Mm. It's not about selling. It's about finding the solution. Yeah. And as as you said earlier about the conditioning, 
there is a very good statement I use, which is, we are born to win, but conditioned to fail. We are all born winners. Mm. You are the one who conceived in the mother's womb. If you would not have fought that millions of sperms, you mm. would not be here. You are yes. the one. But yes. since then, we've been conditioned to a lot of things. And we are still being conditioned, still an adult, we are being conditioned to a lot of things. Yeah. By the society, by the government, by everybody else. It's your own responsibility how you see things as how they are coming towards you. And you say, whether you're going to accept it or whether you say, no, this is not acceptable. Thank you very much. I'm not interested. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so fascinating. My experience. Yeah, and, and it's it's interesting how, you know, especially the customer supplier relationship. Um, I mean, I've, I don't know if you've traveled to the US. Um, I've traveled to the US, not, not recently, a while ago, but I, I was there a lot. And the kind of customer service ethos, you know, if you go into a restaurant or a bar or in a shop, is totally different from the experience even today in, in the UK. It's, it's still has, so much to learn on how to do it, you know, how to listen and how to, I, at first you kind of think, all oh, these Americans, they're really corny, you know, have a good day and all of that. But actually they really mean it because <laughs> they come from this real kind of service ethos. They really, really do mean it. It's not just a fly away comment. Um, so I've, I, you know, I used to notice that a lot, and I like, like you said earlier, in my kind of early roles, I was in customer service too, and I used to get, I was in the textile industry, and I used to get um, people in the London East End um, on the phone to me, and you've lived in London, so you know some of the characters in that part of the world you know, how aggressive they were and, oh, my God, I sometimes had to hold the phone this far away from my ear when they were shouting and screaming at me. But then after I just put the phone down, they rang back and apologized. And so, you know, this flying off the handle and reacting instantly to things, and we see it on social media every day. I'm guilty of it too. You know, I admit I'm guilty of it too. You just get drawn into a conversation or something that's happened in the news and you just want to vent and you kind of go, what? And, and you can easily see when people get drunk and they say things online that later they really do regret um, because the conditioned response is out of control then. <laughs> Absolutely. I think uh, we have so many subliminal languages or so many messages coming up on our screen which we don't know, don't see that because that just goes straight into our brain mm. and it just changes our brain chemicals and we can't react. Simple example is that you're watching a TV in the night with your, your spouse and you suddenly see an ad comes up on your screen saying indulge yourself with a haagen and you says, well, I feel like having an ice cream. Yes. Go to the freezer and get out the ice cream tub, and by the end of the movie, you finish the tub. And then, then yes. you started feeling guilty about it. But I had a whole tub, yes. and I had to start looking after my calories. So these are the things, these are the things that happen mm. within yeah. society, within the culture, within a lot of things is happening. Mm. We, we, are, we are not going to uh, get rid of those things. But we can learn how to create boundaries as going right. forward. The boundaries that you see yourself there can you do not break those boundaries. Because at the end of the day, you are the one who will be the one who will suffer. Your spouse is not going to suffer. Yeah, right. she will suffer actually with your imbalanced emotions. Yes. All right. We men are being told that we can't we don't show our emotions. Mm. That's the fact. And that's the condition. And if you remember mm. your childhood, 
if you remember your childhood when you were growing up and if you fell down, nobody will bother about it because you were a boy. Mm. Yeah? But if yes. the girl falls down, everybody will start carrying her and say, Oh, darling, you fell down. Or, you, should be, or, you should be watching the this and that and then cuddling. And that's a different conditioning. A yeah. boy has been treated completely differently as a girl and vice mm. versa. And that's the conditioning from the outset. You grow up, you started showing your emotion. People look at you and say, Excuse me, what are you talking about? <laughs> Why you are so weak? Why you are so weak? Mm. Uh, you yeah. are not supposed to show emotions. We have to suppress our emotions so we can have a, a testicular cancer, we can have heart attacks, we have diabetic, we are uh, high blood pressure, we mm. have depression. These are because we are suppressing all our emotions inside. Yeah. And that's the biggest issue, or I would say the, the, the cancer of the society we, as men, we carry ourselves. Yeah. Because if you show your emotion in front of your spouse, your spouse will get, no, 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 you are a man. Be a man. Mm. Man up. Yeah. Man up. Man up. Mm. Because then, then you'll say, oh, I have to man up. Then you started angry, angry uh, your anger comes. Up. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. You can't be angry. No. So he says, well, I can't be angry. I can't show my emotion. What the heck do I do with my emotions? Okay, yeah. let me suppress it. Let me suppress yeah. it. Let me suppress it. And one day it blasts it in a different way because it's created, mm. is in your body. If yeah. something goes not out from your system, what is going to happen? It'll suppress. Yeah. It'll come out in a different ways. Yeah. And suddenly, one day, you are just pop dead. And it says, oh, what a good man. He just passed away. Yeah. He was suffering mm. inside. Nobody knows what was going on inside. Mm. So that's another area which is important with emotional intelligence. And I said to a lot of people, I said to a lot of my customers, I said to them, it's better out than in. Yes. Let it be out. Mm. Yeah. Let it be out. Girls who are suffering with uh, their uh, uh, menstrual cycle, mm. as though I have a period twice a month, you know, you've got emotional issues. Mm. Oh, yeah, there might be a diet issues, there might be something imbalance going on in your body. Mm. But a lot of things are related to issues. You said, us as men, we have scars on our skin or something like comes out on, on our body. Mm. But we are suppressing a lot of emotions inside. Yeah, not taking it out, and then these are the things which happens to our disease in our body. Yeah, and when you uh, talk to your uh, uh, man, another man, you know about this emotional intelligence, they hide behind the facade of being very strong and everything, mm. not realizing that they are actually dying inside. Yes, they want somebody to listen to. I have an episode like I was sitting in a bus. I was sitting and somebody next to me just start chatting with me. Talking, 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 talking. Mm. I did not say a single word. I was just listening. Yeah. When he finished, he says, oh, thank you for listening. Thank you. Bye. That's it. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, brilliant. So Sam, how, how, how are you working with your clients? I mean, how do you find clients? Um, how do you work with them? What What's the program that you deliver? Do you go into companies? Is it one-on-one -on -one work? Is it teamwork? Tell us a little bit about that. So I do one-to-one -one, uh, coaching uh, sessions with my uh, clients. I get yes. clients via LinkedIn and word of mouth. Yes. How I, because emotional intelligence is a quite a, a niche area. Well, mm. sometimes it is required people to understand. If you start talking to a mechanical engineer, he says, what you're talking about, right? Yeah. I have no idea about emotional. I want to fix mm. things. I'm a fixer. Yeah. So you can't actually get into their mindset in terms mm. of being, even though they know it's very important, but they shut it down because they'll say, no, I'm not interested in going into emotion. Is my wife, if, if my, my marriage is going in a, in a, in a, a pile of dirt, let it be. No, rather yeah. than in that. 
So there, are, there is always a distinction between how people, but right now, uh, in this present moment, a lot of senior executives are looking into emotional intelligence at the moment because they are looking at that as a very pivotal uh, tool yeah. to work with different people in different areas. I give the example of a sales team. If the sales director knows uh, emotional uh, trait of each and every salesman in his company, mm. he may be able to direct the team in a different ways. Mix two yeah. people with a different skill set, saying, okay, you have a very strong uh, dominance in the area and you have very analytical part. So why don't the analytical part capture all the requirement of the of the customer and you as a dominance, you can deliver it to capture the business. Yeah. Uh, so looking at those sort of de- different areas and you can develop those areas between two team members as well. So that sure. member also not being left out and so I'm always doing this, this. I'm not giving an opportunity to do that. But you know that your team has what learning development areas and where their strengths are. So you mm. can actually balance those things to articulate your business going forward. Yeah. That's where but that's where the 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 essence lie lies in terms of gaining the confidence in your product or services as well as in your team to deliver the better results for the company. Yeah. No, that's that makes a lot of sense. Um a lot of it is needed in this country, that's for sure. No, and not only in this country, around the, well, around around the, the world. world. Yeah, around, around the, the world. world. I would yeah. say, because different cultures look at differently. If I mm. would talk about India or Pakistan, they look at their their employees as their their servants. Yes. Completely servants. Like, if the boss mm. comes at, let's say your, your job is supposed to start at 9 o'clock, which you did, mm. But you can't finish at five o'clock or six o'clock because the boss is sitting in the house in the office. Right. The time boss goes from the office, then you finish. Whether he will be sitting there for eight o'clock or he might be sitting at the ten o'clock. <laughs> you still have to sit there. So you are not respecting the humans or no. human behavior. You are looking mm. them as just a servant. Commodity, yeah. 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 yeah, and that's why a lot of big companies look at employees as just a number, mm. not an asset or ambassador. I said another example of you have got a marketing team and you've got about 100 people in your marketing team doing the marketing jobs and XYZ thing. You've got a very big, large company. What about your employees? Are they not supposed to be your ambassador buying your goods, mm. buying your services, taking care of all those sort of things? Or you are looking for somebody else to do it for you? First of yeah. all, why don't you make sure that your company employees are your ambassador so they mm. can be talking, walking, and uh, screaming, talking about the company's services and product instead of you hiring 100 people to do the job when yeah. you only got a big uh, people in your company who can do the same thing. Yeah. 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 I mean... Yeah, there's so many lost opportunities in that way. Yeah, hundred percent. And yeah, it's it's a shame, you know. But where do you see if if you said, or let's say, um, hundred percent? Okay, let's take a figure. Hundred percent. If hundred percent of everybody are aware of emotional intelligence, right? They've they've absorbed it. They know what to do. They're living their lives. They're treating people with good relationships and everything. And then, where that would be a hundred percent. Where do you, in your opinion, let's just talk about the UK, for example, because that's where we're talking. Um, how far forward are we in this country with becoming more aware of emotional intelligence and using it in our day to day lives? What kind of percentage out of 100 would you say? I would say 20%. Right. Okay. 20%. I mean, that's taking on board <laughs> right at the beginning, looking at the sunshine and the clouds. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. 20% positive, isn't it? Yeah. Um, 
that means that's that's good news, and it's, you it's know exactly. you're partially responsible for helping that. Um, and there's a long way to go too. <laughs> There is no such thing as not learning. Learning is everyday learning. You're learning from yourself. You're learning from your colleagues. You're learning from your siblings, your children. Yes. Learning. But again, if you need to have that ma open mind to learn. If you have yeah. that mind where you said, you know what? I know everything. You are mm -hmm. not going to be going forward in your life because people will look at you that an arrogant. People look mm -hmm. at you as an egoistic person. People look at you as, oh, yeah, he got answers to everything, but he does not do anything. I um, I heard a, a, a very famous, um, what, I don't know what I would call him. Let's call, uh, well, he's a doctor, but he's also uh, a coach and he looks at health, mind and body. Uh, and you know who he is. Um, yeah, Dr. I know. Deep, Deep, Deepak, Deepak Chopra, Chopra, yeah. Deepak yeah. Chopra. And he was interviewed on a on a program, like a documentary type thing, uh, called One. And in in there he was interviewed and he started by saying, My name is Dr. Deepak Chopra. Um, I'm still learning what I'm gonna do when I grow up. <laughs> you know. So you're right. We every day is a school day. Other people say as well. You know, we're we're always having to learn and grow. And and I mean, in fairness, I didn't start learning properly about myself until like was about 17 years ago. You know, I didn't start learning learning <laughs> once I left school. <laughs> You know, I learned very little at school. I wasn't a good learner. It was only once I left school that I started to learn. So fascinating. Sometimes sometime we started to also do unlearning because we have learned so many things. We started to unlearning because yes. the conditioning which has been put onto us. Yes. If, I were, if you as a man, as I as a man, will be remain a man, living in the society of men domination, mm. we have to act like men. We have to treat a woman as a woman, not mm. anything else. And so you mm. have the not the right space or right thing as a man. So you stay wherever you are. You are not going to be given this opportunity mm. to shine. It's only man can shine. But because we have taken a path to unlearn those societal norms, and we come out from that arena and saying, you know what? No, this is not right. You know, I, I can be a better uh, human being. Yes. I can be aware of myself. What makes me content and happy inside? Because happiness is an inside job, not an outside job. No, no. It's an inside job. Yeah. You need to be content here. Yeah. To spread the word of love. Mm. Or they spread the love more and more because you'll say, you know what, I see things and you also have acknowledged things like people who are, are begging on the road, on the street. Yes. There is a story behind it. Yeah. We can't judge a book from its cover. No. Because we can't judge a person while he's, yeah, a lot of people say that a lot of stories about, oh yeah, or they have a big balance and they have this, they have that. Yeah, I've, I've read the story, I've seen the story, I've seen the uh, clippings in the newspaper and everything, the videos and everything. Yeah, but you can't categorize everybody into the same box. No. Yeah. So everyone has a story, different story. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Different circumstances. Yeah. 100%. 100%. Yeah. That's why I do this podcast, Sam. <laughs> to hear those wonderful stories. <laughs> so, Sam, how can people get in touch with you to, you know, to be coached by you or go on one of your programs or how can they find you? Yes, uh, very simple. Uh, all, all, all social media. My uh, handle is Coach Sam UK. Coach Sam UK. Yeah. That's easy. That's easy. Just search for that and you might be end up on my 
podcast you can end up on my youtube channel you might end up on my linkedin my facebook my instagram my snapchat and my um what's called uh clubhouse clubhouse yeah yeah <laughs> that's the latest fashionable place to be it is although i have to say twitter twitter yeah yeah spaces are doing a good job too yeah, very small <laughs> Very but Clubhouse have got the, you know, the kind of disruptor advantage, haven't they? They've yeah. got the disruptor advantage very much. The so. Green Room. Have you heard about Green Room? Yes. Now Spotify. Yeah, I'm yeah. very interested in that. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Too much going because, on. Because because there you can record it and turn it into a podcast. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Love that. Love that. Sam, is there anything else that I haven't got out of you that you want to share with everybody? You know what I will say, uh, Michael, thank you very much for inviting me to share my journey. Uh, one thing which I would like to uh, share and leave it with you for your audience is start living in the moment of bliss and happiness. What has happened to you was a journey. What is going to happen to you is going to be a journey. Let like make it a beautiful journey going ahead. Thank you. Wonderful. That's a lovely statement to to leave the this interview. I really appreciate you coming on, also sharing your story. And you're in Birmingham, so I'm not far from Birmingham. So there's no excuse now. Um, often when I get guests on, I say. Well, maybe if you're in the UK, come and say hello. Or if you're in the Midlands, you give me a call. Uh, but we're both in the Midlands. So we must promise then to meet up for a hot drink and a piece of cake uh, well, in the middle of Birmingham. And now that we can do that, there's no excuse, right? Otherwise, also been saying, you know, to people, well, once it's all over, then we'll meet up. <laughs> but I can't say that now. I've I've got to do it. So I'll I'll buy you a, a coffee or a tea and a and a piece of cake uh, soon, Sam. Thank you. It was really a pleasure to meet you in Birmingham sometime. Definitely. Okay. I'll it. definitely stay in touch with you on that. Thanks so much for coming. All the best for now, and hope okay. to see you soon. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye for now. Bye bye. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.